In this video, we would like to tell you about some of the interesting things recently learned about the Basilica in the course of beginning to restore the stained glass windows. The most recent restoration work on the Basilica's stained glass windows began in 2018. Since then, we've learned some amazing things about these historic windows. The first thing we learned is that no two windows have the same dimensions. The Basilica has 63 windows, of which 28 are the large clerestory windows, dating from between 1857 and 1905. No two of these windows have the same dimensions. All are slightly different. We learned this in 2018 when we restored the St. Joseph with the Child Jesus window and the Annunciation window. What this means for the restoration is that every exterior wooden storm window is also of a different bespoke measurement as well. They are not the kind of windows where you'd be able to go to Home Depot and say, I'll have 28 arch-shaped vinyl windows 7 feet wide by 18 feet high. They have to be all made uniquely, they all have to be authentic, and repairs have to be made using original materials. The second thing we learned is that the Basilica has the largest collection in the Western Hemisphere of the mid-20th century Irish arts and crafts stained glass windows. In May 2015, the Minister of State of the Government of Ireland for the Diaspora, Jimmy Deanahan, walked into the Basilica and asked to see the stained glass windows in the side aisles or ambulatories. He then told us that Research from the National Gallery of Ireland has shown that the Basilica's collection of windows in the ambulatories were all the work of the famous Irish stained glass artist Gerard Early. The Early family stained glass is renowned in Ireland and in Europe. Gerard's grandfather worked with and for Augustus Welby Pugin on many of the neo-Gothic buildings of the mid-1800s in London. By the mid-1900s, Gerard Early and his studio were producing striking windows in the arts and crafts style, characterized by square and diamond and blown glass patterns. Minister Deanahan walked into the Basilica and then into the Marian Chapel and then tweeted to Irish Design 2015 that he was exploring the largest collection of Irish arts and crafts stained glass windows in North America in NL. And then, on October the 8th, 2018, after the Irish government changed, the new government's Minister of State for the Diaspora, Karen Cannon, visited the Basilica and looked at the windows again. Cannon's team tweeted about these windows to the National Gallery of Ireland's 54,000 Twitter followers worldwide and the Dublin City Art Gallery's uh, 50,000 Twitter followers. Archbishop Curry then found out that Minister Cannon was an accomplished pianist and organist for Mass in his own parish church in Ireland. So he invited him to sit down and play the basilica organ. The third thing we learned from the restoration of the windows was the identity of one of the most interesting families of donors of stained glass windows in the basilica. They weren't doctors. They weren't lawyers or members of the clergy. And they weren't teachers or fish merchants. They were the family of the owner of the local pub, Richard Ivory, known to his friends as Dickie Ivory. In particular, it was his wife, Johanna Ivory, and his business partner, William Walsh, who made the donations. Ivory lived from 1810 to 1882, and Walsh lived from 1818 to 1892. Ivory's family donated, in his memory, three windows in the nave of the Basilica, the patron saints of Ireland. They are St. Columba, St. Bridget and St. Patrick, and also possibly the window of the crucifixion on the south side of the west transept. The windows were donated in 1891 in Ivory's memory and from his fortune. I was first told about Dickie Ivory in the late 1980s. I used to play the organ at 7 p.m. Sunday night mass at the Basilica, and one of the people who went to that mass was the late magistrate John Pius Mulcahy. Back in the 1980s, magistrate Mulcahy was in his mid-80s, and he told me that he had been told by his mother when he was a young child, when he asked where someone was sitting in the basilica, that they were sitting right there under Dickie Ivory. 
In 1891, the Daily Colonist newspaper, and on the 31st of October, 1892, the Evening Herald newspaper, described these windows. Ivory and Walsh were both proud Irish emigrants to Newfoundland from County Kilkenny, Ireland, and they both would have known Bishop Fleming very well. Dickie Ivory's pub was located at the top of Prescott Street at the corner of Military Road and Rollins Cross on the south side of Military Road across from what's now the Hungry Heart Cafe. Thanks to the Newfoundland photographer Simeon Parsons in 1878, we actually have this photo of his pub or Shibin located and situated right next to this bow arch that was built across Military Road in the summer of 1878. The arch was built and the photo of it was taken to welcome the bi visit of Bishop George Conroy, the apostolic delegate to Newfoundland. Dickie Ivory was a very prosperous parishioner of the cathedral parish. His pub was perfectly situated halfway between the sacred, the cathedral, and the profane, the house of assembly at the colonial building. His was the local pub for both. The fourth thing we learned is that there are actually mistakes in several of the basilica stained glass windows. In one case, the mistake has been there like that for 133 years. We became aware of this when the windows were carefully photographed by Robert Young for the book that he and I did in 2018 on the Basilica Stained Glass Windows. In September 1888, two new stained glass windows arrived in St. John's. The Evening Herald's newspaper for the 1st of September 1888 noted their arrival. The usual and safest method for shipping stained glass windows back in that day from Europe to Newfoundland was in a barrel filled with, no, not rum, but molasses. When they arrived, you just washed the molasses off and voila, tasty windows. Yum, yum, yum. More details about the windows are told in Susan's fantastic book, The Story of the Basilica, and in Robert's and my book about the windows. And these books, Susan, make excellent Christmas gifts, I'm sure you'd agree. Yes, I do. <laughs> and here's where it gets more interesting. It seems that Melchizedek and the Nativity Windows by the artist Louis Lichtenheld Koch of Beauvais, France, were both installed the same time in the cathedral. In fact, almost on the same night. And when we look closely at both windows, there are mistakes. If you look at the Melchizedek window, an angel's right wing and hand are materializing out of thin air right next to Melchizedek's right ear. And if you look at the nativity window installed at the same time as the Melchizedek window, the angel on the left is missing its right wing. And if you look at the foot of baby Jesus, lying in the manger at the nativity window. There's a strange thing in the stable at Bethlehem. There's a mitre, a bishop's hat looking for all the world like Melchizedek's high priest's hat from being the high priest of Israel. So in fact, two panels from Melchizedek and two panels from the nativity were swapped at the time of installation. And since we have no records of any later work on these windows, this leads us to think that they've been like that since they were installed. Maybe what really happened was that the two fellas installing these windows in the cathedral did so after last mass or after the cathedral fell silent on an August or September evening and maybe they stopped off at Dickie Ivory's pub for a pint before coming to do the work and then in the fading light they got confused and mixed the panels up. There is another mistake in the Basilica stained glass windows. The pallium window commemorates the creation of Michael Francis Howley as the first Archbishop of Newfoundland and shows his coat of arms, along with those of his suffragan diocese, St. George's on the west coast with the cross of St. George and the Immaculate Conception coat of arms of Harbour Grace Diocese. And here's a picture from the lower part of the pallium window showing the coats of arms of the three dioceses. Look carefully at the inscription on the Harbour Grace coat of arms. It's from a verse of one of the five antiphons of the Psalms of the Second Vespers for the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. The first verse in Latin is Tota pulcra est Maria et macula originalis non est in te. 
which in English is, You are all beautiful, Maria, and the stain of original sin is not in you. This is what that verse from the Vesper sounds like. But take another look. This window doesn't say tota pulchra. It says iota pulchra. That's right, an iota. As in, you haven't got one iota, meaning you are only a tiny bit beautiful. So how do we learn this? Well, it was pointed out then by none other than His Excellency Archbishop Luigi Bonazzi, the Apostolic Nuncio of Pope Francis to Canada. Archbishop Bonazzi imposed the pallium on Archbishop Peter Hunt on the 12th of September, 2019. The day before that, John gave the nuncio a tour of St. John's. Well, he first visited the gathering place and met the leaders of Presentation and Mercy Sisters and Joanne Thompson, who's now an MP. He visited Presentation Convent and admired the Veiled Virgin. We had a hard time getting him away from the exceptional hospitality of the sisters. Then he hit Signal Hill. He really wanted to climb the Basilica Towers. What do you say when the Pope's representative wants to inspect a papal basilica? Right this way, Your Excellency. And he even wanted to see and ring the St. John bell. So we ended up in the organ loft before the pallium window where, of course, he pointed out this grave error to me and, of course, held me personally responsible. How did Tota become Iota? Most likely, when the pallium stained glass window was being restored in the early 2000s, the panels were removed and the painting, like this lettering, was repainted. At that time, the artist found a panel which read Iota because the paint had delaminated from the glass due to thermal shock and didn't know that it was supposed to be Tota, not Iota. When the Basilica Foundation first learned the extent of the weakness of the stained glass windows, and particularly the outer storm windows, many of which have dry rot, the first thing we did was secure and reinforce the storm windows with steel bracing anchored into the mortar joints of the stone of the Dublin granite outer window arches. In the process of doing that work, two of the workers were aloft on a boom lift on the back of the basilica, inspecting the windows of the apse behind the high altar. And in the westernmost window on the outside of a piece of stained glass, in fact on the outside of the stained glass window depicting St. Simon, this etching was found. Thomas Wright, Glazier, Snettisham, 1846. Now Thomas Wright was a stained glass artist known to practice in Leeds, England. Snedisham was a hamlet near the town of King's Lynn in the English county of Norfolk. It is very likely that this piece of glass was originally in one of Wright's windows at Snedisham. And our window, which shows St. Simon, St. James the Less, and St. Matthew, was created for the Basilica by the famous English stained glass maker William Warrington. Warrington's work is found in the Palace of Westminster, the British Parliament, in Ely Cathedral, and in St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle. Here in the Basilica, we have not one but seven large Warrington windows, the five in the apse and one in the center of each of the transept galleries. And next door, a presentation convent has two in the Oratory Chapel, where the Veiled Virgin is, and three lights in a window in the hallway. In other words, here at this complex, we have the largest collection of Warrington windows in the Western Hemisphere, all remarkably in the medieval English neo-Gothic style for this, an Irish neoclassical cathedral. And when Warrington got the commission from Bishop Mullock to do the windows for this cathedral, it was a huge commission. He needed to find a lot of glass quickly wherever it could be found. So poor Thomas Wright. 
at least one of his windows got taken apart and reused by Warrington to build our windows here. So we are constantly learning new things and we have two new discoveries to tell you about. Over in the storage rooms behind the Episcopal Library for years has been stored this panel, a fragment of a stained glass window. The inscription on it reads, commemorating the consecration of Archbishop Roach, June 29, 1915. In fact, it is the lower quarter of a window, the bottom sash of a stained glass window that would sit above it. But until this past summer, we had no idea what the rest of that window might have looked like. In 1991, I interviewed the St. John's architect, William Ryan, who's now deceased, and it was about the architectural history of the Basilica. He told me that in 1954, when the renovations began for the cathedral's 100th anniversary, the administrator, Monsignor Summers and Archbishop Skinner, commissioned the painting of the cathedral and commissioned the 35 Irish arts and crafts stained glass windows for the ambulatories by the Irish artist Gerard Early. The problem was there were already several stained glass windows in the ambulatories. So Summers and Skinner had them removed to make way for the new full set of early windows. What did these windows removed in 1954 look like? In the absence of photographs we don't know definitively, is the Archbishop Roach window sash a part of one of them? But then we made a remarkable discovery this past summer. One of our technical advisors, Ryan Hayward, texted me one evening to say that these windows were being sold on Facebook. So I went online and found them and immediately recognized that they were the same surrounding pattern as the fragment of the window we had in storage. And so off John went on a quest to the man who was selling them out of his garage over on Roach's line. And while he had already sold one of the windows, he had three, to someone nearby, through the generosity of a donor, the foundation was able to acquire the two remaining ones, St. Francis of Assisi and St. John the Baptist. Of these, the surround of the St. John the Baptist window matches the style of the Archbishop Roach sash in under the window, and the gentleman told me that he had them for about 12 or 15 years and bought them from a man who had a painting business and had them stored in his warehouse. This leaves you wondering, what was the window that got away? And of course, it was the most gorgeous of them all, it was St. Bridget, but we don't have that window. So we had Brendan Blackmore of Sunhound Glassworks examine them. He has done the restoration of the other windows in the Basilica, and he thinks they were the work of the McCausland Studios of Toronto, done in about 1915. And again, they're in the arts and crafts style. So while we do not know exactly where in the Basilica complex they came from, we do know several things. They are not from the Episcopal Library, because those windows are in a different style again. And they're not from the Marian Chapel, because that didn't exist in 1915. They could be from the old palace next to the Basilica, which burned in 1919, except there is no indication of smoke or fire damage to these windows. And because the old chapel was a relatively small building, about half the size of the new palace, which is there since 1923, it is not likely there was a chapel in the old palace big enough to hold three windows. So the most likely place these windows came from in the Basilica complex was from the Basilica itself. And they were the windows, or some of the windows, that were removed in 1954. So now they're home. We hope to find a potential donor to have them restored and then to incorporate them into an interpretation of our stained glass window history. And with the help of a potential donor, we also hope to convince the, the owner to let us bring St. Bridget back home. And so we arrive at the story of the solstices. In 2018, while I was researching for the Basilica Stained Glass book, I remembered what Magistrate Mulcahy told me about the windows that were installed over where Dickie Ivory used to sit in the Basilica 150 years ago. We already knew that the earliest windows to appear in the Basilica were the five Warrington windows in the apse, installed in 1857 by Bishop Mullock. And this, of course, led to the question, 
Why did Moloch put them there, in the apse, and not elsewhere in the basilica? The first thing we did was have Robert Young photograph them, and with crisp images it became clear that their subject matter was the apostles and the holy family. Why did Moloch put those windows there? I also remembered something else. When I was playing the organ here one June evening back in the late 1980s, I was sitting in the organ loft and seeing the sun set through the exact center window over the sanctuary organ in the other end of the basilica. So I wondered, could it be? So I contacted Randy Dodge, the head of computing at Memorial University. Randy was also the head of the St. John's chapter of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And I asked him, if you stood in a certain part of St. John's on the winter solstice and in the same place on the summer solstice, where would the sun rise on December 21st, the shortest day of daylight in the year, and where would the sun set on June 21st, the longest day of daylight in the year? And he asked me, where would you be standing? And I said, on the front steps of the basilica. So Randy sent me this map which shows that on the winter solstice, the sun rises almost directly in front of the Basilica Cathedral, and on the summer solstice, the sun sets through the exact center windows of the Basilica's apse. And he said this would not have changed much in 170 years. But we had to see this for ourselves, which meant we had to get into the Basilica before 8 a.m. on the 21st of December to see what sunrise on the winter solstice looks like, and to be here after 8 p.m. on June 21st to watch sunset at the summer solstice. So this is what sunrise on the winter solstice looks like when you're down in the, on the floor of the church looking up at the organ loft windows. And this is a series of shots showing the sequence of sunset on the summer solstice. Which means that this cathedral was built, and before it was built, Bishop Fleming got up on the barrens with his pins on the solstices a few years before they dug the hole for the foundations and laid out where this church was going to go. It means that you are visiting in the Basilica Newfoundland's New Grange, a latter-day Stonehenge. But that's, well, pagan, isn't it? Well, Stonehenge and Newgrange are pagan, and the story would end there, except that this solstitial axis has implications for telling us about what we're looking at in this cathedral. Because we still haven't answered the question of why Bishop Fleming and Bishop Mullock laid out this cathedral and put in the first stained glass windows in the apse so that on the sunset, at the summer solstice, the sun sets through the apostles' windows. The answer is found in the medieval Catholic Basilic Cathedral of Chartres, France, the one with the acres of stained glass, the World Heritage Site. In that cathedral, the sun on the summer solstice also sets through its apostles' windows in its apse, and in, in every cathedral, everything has a symbol, a reason, or a purpose. At Chartres, the setting of the sun on the longest day of sunlight of the year symbolizes the fullness of time, the end of time. The going down of the sun symbolizes the last judgment. And shining through those windows, the sun points at something. At the last judgment, when you go towards the pearly gates, what question are you going to be asked? You'll be asked how you lived your life like one of the apostles. Chark, which was built from 1194 to 1220, was not the only Christian church built on a solstitial axis. According to Duncan Stroik, who's a professor of architecture at Notre Dame University in South Bend, Indiana, the Basilica of St. Francis of Assisi in Assisi, Italy, built over the tomb of the founder of the Franciscan order, St. Francis, between 1228 and 1253, was also built on a solstitial axis. And St. Peter's Basilica, the Vatican, was also built over a period of 120 years on a solstitial axis. And right there lies the clue to reading this Basilica Cathedral in its authentic historical context. This church was designed and built by one Franciscan, Michael Fleming, and decorated, elaborated, and embellished by another Franciscan, Fleming's successor, John Thomas Mullock. The St. John's Basilica is a Franciscan church. 
inspired by the iconography and the charism of St. Francis and his order. We see St. Francis in our stained glass and right next to him, the nativity depicted in stained glass. Francis had a tremendous fascination with the nativity. He read it as one of God's greatest gifts to us, the incarnation. As you will recall, the nativity scene was invented by St. Francis with the man dressed as Joseph and a woman as Mary and a baby as baby Jesus with real lambs and shepherds and magi. In this church, the original nativity bambino or baby Jesus ordered by Bishop Mullock was this 300 pound marble statue carved by Filippo Gersi. Like the one in the Vatican, it's too heavy to carry in procession so the bishop would unveil it at midnight mass. Today, you can see it in the pastoral center before you enter the nativities exhibit at the Episcopal Library during Advent. As Professor Stroik pointed out in his lecture, Francis Rebuild My Church, the Franciscan Tradition of Sacred Architecture, a seminar given to the Franciscan University of Steubenville in Ohio, and this talk is on YouTube, in St. Francis's charism, he read all of nature as pointing to the hand of God and his creation. The summit of that creation was his gift of Christ, his son, the incarnation. So Francis taught that everything in a church had to reflect that creation on earth and in heaven. To achieve that by Fleming and Mullock's time, the ideal was classical architecture with its acanthus leaves and egg and dart and images of heaven and earth, and the cherubs in the pendant drop of the ceiling, and the Corinthian capitals, and the images of the saints. That also meant depicting here, repeatedly, as in all Franciscan churches, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. So we have a wonderful statue outside of the Immaculate Conception by Irishman John Edward Carew, who worked in London. We have the statue by Italian sculptor Filippo Gersi inside and a large stained glass window by the German Louis Koch, who worked in France, located in the West Gallery of the transept, and another window by the Irishman Gerard Early in the Marian Chapel. This is a Franciscan church because as Bishop Howley wrote in 1885, Bishop Fleming placed his coat of arms the coat of arms of the Franciscan order, on a marble plaque and placed it in the narthex or front porch of this church over the front door. We think it's probably buried behind the plaster of the wall over one of the entrances. This is also a Franciscan church because on one of the dice or pedestals that the original high altar table rested, um, which is up where the chair of the presider now, now is, there is a coat of arms of the Franciscans. And for further proof this was built as a church, a Franciscan church, the first and greatest Franciscan church in the New World, look at the front facade of the Basilica of St. Francis of Assisi here. It has a rose window and at each corner a statue or symbol of one of the four evangelists, highlighting what for St. Francis was the primacy of the evangelists and the gospels. Here at our Basilica, we don't have a rose window, but we do have a great rose, and it has the four evangelists at each corner, just like Assisi. Look up. In order of completion, first the statues of the evangelists were put in, but the first ceiling put in this basilica was flat and white, no great rose. That was installed under Bishop Mullock in about 1852-53, and it remained until the 20th century. In 1903 to 1905, when Bishop Howley was preparing the cathedral for its 50th anniversary, he decide, designed the Great Rose, working with the Conway family of plasterers, with painter and sculptor Dan Carroll, and with architect Jonas Barter. And finally, in 1954-55, the basilica ceiling was painted and polychromed by Leif Neandros, who was working for the Rambush Decorating Company of New York. He had previously painted camouflage for the U.S. military in World War II. 
Here, Neandros painted the symbols of the Virgin Mary from the Litany of Loreto into the ceiling, fulfilling the Marian symbolism found in a Franciscan church. I'd suggest you go online and have a look at the Heritage Moments videos that we've put on the Basilica Heritage Foundation website. So many things in this cathedral relate back to its Franciscan architectural heritage.